My guest today is Amanda Kuda. We're talking all about breaking up with alcohol today. And Amanda has a really interesting perspective because she was not in the throes of alcohol addiction. She wasn't in rehab. She was just somebody who socially drank quite a bit and started feeling this intuitive pull to let it go. Um, She was already doing a lot of healthy things and a lot of mindset work and all of that. And she talks about what happened, the magical life of ease that unfolded in her life after she let go of alcohol. She wrote a book about it. It's called Unbottled Potential, Break Up With Alcohol and Break Through to Your Best Life. This is one of the most powerful messages I've heard about what can happen when you let go of alcohol in your life. So if it's just something that you relate to that where... It's not like you're not like going into rehab, but you're, you know, you're kind of drinking and you kind of know it's not really the greatest thing for you, but you're not really sure what you're going to do about that. I think this episode will really inspire you. So we'll go ahead and dive in. Here is Amanda Kuda. Amanda, I'm so, I'm so excited to speak uniquely with you about breaking up with alcohol because like, as I've read about you, like you weren't, it's not like you were like in rehab and had these deep, deep, crazy levels of addiction. You just drank alcohol Mm -hmm. and then you tried not drinking alcohol and you had a pretty big breakthrough. And I find that while, um, well, of course, you know, we definitely need support for people who are deep in the throes of addiction and there's a lot available to them. There's a lot of people in the boat you were in a lot, whether oh, yeah. like I'm not necessarily like full blown alcoholic life is falling apart, but I'm definitely not going to let go of my nightly little yeah. drink, you a, know, a habitual so can, drinker for sure. <laughs> so can you share with us a little bit about yourself and what brought you here and what got you to write your book, which by the way, is called unbottled potential break up with alcohol and break through to your best life. So what brings us here? Yeah, I would love to, you know, I think that I really am glad you started off with that because there really wasn't anything remarkable about my drinking story. There wasn't a rock bottom, you know, I, have a history of addiction in my family, but I, you know, did all the tests to confirm that I was not experiencing alcohol use disorder. I talked to my therapist about it and I really covered the basis because I kept having this sense of knowing right around the time I was in my late twenties, that it was time to stop drinking. And that sense of knowing felt kind of annoying and absurd because I was just a regular social drinker. I didn't drink during the week. I didn't, wasn't ruining my life. In fact, from the outside looking in, my life looked really amazing. I had a great job. I had good friends. I had an active social life. I was dating. I was healthy. I was fit. I was going to yoga, meditating, reading self-help books, journaling. Uh, You know, I was watching my, my, what I was intaking into my life. Like I was doing a lot of the wellness things that were posh back you know, 10 or so years ago. And for whatever reason, it just seemed like none of it was really working. Like I didn't feel like the needle was moving. And there was a part of me that questioned, okay, well, am I broken? Am I doing something wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Or is it maybe not that my life path is about doing, 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 doing more, Mm -hmm. adding more practices, Mm -hmm. but what if it was about looking at something in my life that was suboptimal and removing that And when I looked at my life, the only suboptimal thing that really stood out was alcohol. And oof, let me tell you, as someone who is freshly 30, still very social, that felt like a really painful thing to remove because it was such a normalized and big part of my social life. Mm. And yet I just sensed that I couldn't get to where I wanted to be physically, emotionally, professionally, financially if alcohol kept being a priority in my life. And so, yeah, kind of like you summarized, I removed it. And from that point in my life, everything miraculously catapulted forward. And we can dive deeper into some of those things, but my life has never been the same and it's better in every way possible. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Yes. We're going to dive all in. So, Uh so first you had this little like feeling inside of you, which by the way, what a profound insight that you have. You're like, maybe it's not about doing more. Maybe I need to remove something that's taking away from my quality of life here. Totally profound, mm-hmm. totally relates, you know, and yeah. that is what we, I find. And I'm sure you find is so often it's like people come to me for coaching and they're like, give me more, 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 more. And it's like, Hey, you know, um, let's look at like maybe what some of the problems are that are just taken away from peace. So you had this little inkling that came this little feeling inside of you that was like, maybe I should let go of alcohol. 
Uh-huh. And I want to talk about that little feeling because I know yeah. a lot of people have had that little feeling. Can you share mm-hmm. like did, what happened inside of you when that first started coming up? Did you have these kind of justifications or like, like where, where was that for a minute? Cause I'm sure it wasn't like that day. You just never drink again. Yeah, what No, was I was like, shut part? up little voice inside. Shut up. I don't want to listen right. to you right. because I had put so much social weight on how normal it was to drink. And I had this fear that it would be, I would, I would be abnormal. I would be an outcast if I didn't drink. And so I really tried to negotiate with that little inner sense of knowing. And I tried to say, okay, well, maybe you don't mean quit. Maybe you mean just like moderate and figure out how to make this work for you. And so I really tried all of these tricks to Mm. quote, make alcohol work or make alcohol fit into my life. Mm. And at the end of the day, that little sense of knowing wasn't trying to get me to have like a moderately better life. That sense of knowing was, it was whispering to me that I was on the cusp of something big and I deserved a bigger, more expansive, more abundant life Mm -hmm. and not just removing or taking away alcohol a little or moderating it or drinking it a little less. It was like, you are going to, in fact, I heard audibly one day when I was in the shower, I heard this message that was, that said, Amanda, you have you are meant to do big things in this life. And I can't see you doing them with alcohol in the picture. And it was so profound. I like fell to the floor in my shower and I was weeping, you know, trying to get my my breath because I felt like the universe had just punched me in the gut with this information. And I knew that I, I had always sensed ever since I was a little girl that I had something big to do in my life, but I couldn't, I didn't know what that was. I'm from the middle of nowhere, a cornfield in Missouri, you know? And I believe that voice as an adult so profoundly that I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to test it. I'm going to see what it's like. And with alcohol out of the picture, everything just expanded, but no, to, to fully answer your question, I, I didn't want to listen to the voice. I was afraid I'd be an outcast. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to socialize or, you know, get along at work functions or all of these places where I had made these specific use cases for alcohol being valuable in my life. And the reality is that alcohol was just me cheating. It was just me cheating and depleting myself and depleting my ability to be fully healthy, fully emotionally well, because it was, it just was, it was just making me small and it was keeping me kind of tampered down. And I realized that now I realize looking back, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was like my inner sense of my inner wisdom saying to me that there was something else waiting for me if I would just show up for myself first. And so, yeah, that's what, that's what I felt getting alcohol out of the way was, was choosing to show up for myself. Wow. I so resonate with that. I have so many chills because that's what I have found too, is like these little intuitive things that are coming in saying, let go of that or like, Mm -hmm. like shift this way, let go of that. And we cling to it. We're like holding on with like the grips of our fingers. And we're like, no, cause I'm getting all this good stuff out of it. And it's this loving, loving. It's just like, I'm all this intuitive information you're getting. is just trying to help you live life at a level that you don't even know is possible right now. And it's gentle and it's not like you don't, it's okay. If you, if you cling, it's okay. It's just trying to let you know, trying to do you a homey solid here (laughs) and let you know that like, if you will let this go, it's going to be a little scary, right? You got to let it go, but we can show you a a path and existence that you don't even know is possible for you right now. So you let faith overcome fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that in like the religious sense of the word, it's just the best way I know how to put it Mm -hmm. because it does take that faith. It's like, man, I feel, I don't know what it is. I can't see anything ahead of me, but I feel this feeling of like, if I will let this go, even though I have all these fears, no one's going to like me. No one's going to be my friend. I'm not going to be cool when I hang out with people, all these fears. You were like, Oh, I'm going to let this faith of this blurry future that I'm not yeah. exactly sure where it is. I'm going to, I'm going to choose that instead of this concrete fear-based reality I'm living in huge props. I'm so, cool. so glad I was able to have you on the show. Cause like, Man, thank you so I, much. I feel yeah, like, I feel just like this sense of, you know, I told this story so many times, but in having people summarize it and receive it, mm-hmm. it just gives me this sense of, you know, how proud I should be of myself for listening nice. to that voice, because I yes. could have said no, that's scary. I'd rather stay comfortable. And it was in that willingness to be uncomfortable that I actually found comfort that 
was beyond what I ever had experienced before and ease. I wouldn't even say comfort ease ease. that. And that feels so much better than the safety of the normal quote unquote, normal life I was living before. And it feels really good. It feels really good. And that's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing right now is because I know there are other people out there like me who are normal run of the mill, social or habitual drinkers who are trying to become healthier, are trying to become, you know, in their physical or their mental health, they're trying to achieve goals. They're trying to, you know, they're doing, doing, doing all of the things to optimize their life. And what if it, what if the magic pill were not a pill at all, but actually stopping doing something that's, that's tethering them to their current reality. And I think it's just so important that people hear this message from a non- Mm -hmm you know, as you said, it is so important that we have all these recovery resources, but sometimes that doesn't resonate with someone who is a run of the mill drinker doing, doing really well in life. And I just really want those people to know that you could do so much better and it could be easier. You could do better without having to hustle harder. You could actually Mm -hmm. just organically skyrocket into those goals and those dreams that you have. And I've seen it happen in my own life and in the lives of thousands of others. And it's really cool. It's just really cool to see. Mm -mm -mm. Powerful message. I know a big fear for people who uh, probably could resonate right now are people who are doing really well in business Mm -hmm. and they find that that that's a big fear is like, well, this helps me in my business Mm because I go have these meetings and we get a drink and we like, you know, bond. And then Mm -hmm. that's how I'm building my business is drinking. Or all of my friends drink. So if I don't, I'm not going to have friends. So the business one and that friends one, I I mean that I've seen it per, um, Mm -hmm. you know, firsthand how that traps people. So can you speak on that a little bit? Yes. So in business, whether you're working a traditional nine to five or you're an entrepreneur, I will tell you that how you are, especially because I'm, I know that you speak to a lot of high achievers and that can be a very misleading, um, representation of what you're capable of. Because if you're a go-getter, you're just the kind of person who gets shit done and you're going to make things happen regardless. But what I will tell you is that in your career, being alcohol-free will give you a competitive edge that cannot be matched because you're going to be thinking faster, thinking more creatively. You're going to be more energetic, more resilient. You're going to have more capacity to think at a different level that other people aren't able to think at because they're kind of in this group think space. Mm -hmm. And you're just Mm -hmm. going to be thinking and operating at a level that is so beyond and not from a cocky standpoint. I don't want it to sound like that, but you're going to be tapping into your full mental and creative capacity. And you'll have so much more energy to actually show up for the good work that you're here to do that the socializing factor that you think you're missing out on won't even be an Mm -hmm. issue Mm and, and in work that you're just going to give yourself this competitive edge that cannot be matched. So I wonder Mm -hmm. if you think that that would, you know, resonate or appeal to anyone to just be like, just have a superpower that is almost inexplicable. Mm. Yeah. It's, I hear in that giving credit to alcohol Mm -hmm. that maybe has nothing to do with alcohol. And then also thinking if you're already performing at high levels and you're sorry to say, but dumbing down your cognitive capacities and you're Mm -hmm. all from the, from the next day and you're already performing at high levels. Think, think how, where you could be if you didn't have that. Totally. Right. You're likely a rock star. Yeah. Think how, think how much easier and much more ahead you could get without Mm -hmm. having your cognitive capacities limited throughout the day, because you felt you gave credit to this drink last night when you didn't even need it. You're just good at what you do. Yep. You'd be unstoppable. I I fully feel you'd be unstoppable. And, and with, I think the thing that is so important that I never want to confuse is I'm not saying you'd have, you'd be able to do more. Like I'm not trying to like glorify hustle culture. I'm actually trying to like glorify ease culture. Like you would do what you're doing and then some with way less effort because you're not having to muscle through the hangover and the fogginess and the fuzziness that is there no matter how much or little you drink. It's definitely there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about like, so you had that shower moment, which Mm -hmm. I so relate to. I've had moments like that where I'm like sobbing, like it's so overcoming. So I totally relate. Um, what, what happened next? What did you do? What happened next? Handle that. Yeah. I, you know, I had already in that moment, I was already taking a break from alcohol with, with Mm -hmm. a lot of resistance. I was already taking Mm -hmm. a break from alcohol 
And it was that moment that I realized that I needed to keep the break going, that it wasn't just a break, that it needed to be a breakup. And like with any breakup, you kind of got to go no contact for a while to get over it. And so I decided I wasn't going to drink for 90 days to six months. I was going to give it a real solid runway. And within that time frame, I just started showing up for myself in a different way. It was as if, you know, um, I'm, I would imagine, have you read atomic habits by James clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Top self-help book of the last five years. So most people who listening have probably read it. Um, and he has, it's not in his book, but this is a tweet he put out a long time ago. And he has this quote that says the ultimate form of optimization is elimination. Nothing is more effective than removing the ineffective. And so, you know, kind of to speak to that subtraction factor that I had mentioned before, all of a sudden, when I subtracted the most ineffective thing in my life, all of the other effective things I was doing, the journaling, the workouts, the healthy eating, the yoga, the meditation, they just amplified. And all of a sudden they just clicked into place in this way that they hadn't before. And so once I started having all of those things really, really work at full capacity, I felt really freaking good. And I felt powerful. I felt confident. Now, granted, I still had a lot of stuff, you know, shit come up like we all do that I had to, had to work through and will continue to work through. But all of a sudden I felt so hopeful and so capable and that even my wildest dreams were now within reach that I didn't have this sense that I wanted to go back to alcohol. So I started kind of talking about what was happening for me on the internet you know, kind of shyly. And for however it happened, it started to reach the right people. And so as a part of that, I committed to not drinking. I committed to, um, you know, I have a coaching background, but I had never intended to coach in the sobriety space. That just had never even occurred to me, but because people kept saying, wow, that sounds like my story, or that sounds like where I am. Can you help me? I started a coaching business. I quit my nine to five job and, Then a couple of years into this journey, I was offered a book deal with a top five publisher. And these are dreams that had been on my heart for my entire life. And it's just like this one small, but very significant decision turned my life around in a way that, and I I don't like to use the word turn my life around because it wasn't like my life was in a bad place, but it just changed the trajectory of my life in a way that I could never have even fathomed because it just seems so wild and out there that all of these really awesome things would have happened for me in kind of a five or six year period. And I know that being alcohol free was the turning point for it. Wow. Okay. Just for way of inspo of anybody Mm -hmm. listening, if you're having that intuitive thing come in, that is exactly how I got my book deal too, was Mm -hmm. I had a scary moment. I was very specialized in the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. all of my clients were keto clients. Mm -hmm. Keto was booming. That's how I started getting like celebrities and athletes and Mm -hmm. this like really high level clientele. So I was like, yeah, I'm a keto specialist and like, this is my world. And I'm going around all these keto events and it was getting really dogmatic. It was like, this is the only way humans should be eating. This is the most optimal way. And it's kind of this energy of like, people are stupid if they don't realize it. And Um, I had been keto for a year and had started bringing some carbs back in and I was feeling real good. And I was, Mm -hmm. I noticed the benefits of keto, but I noticed, man, like bringing some carbs back in was like super, super good for me. Like that whole thing of like going into keto and coming back out, that was really good. And I started feeling that thing, like your, your alcohol thing. It was like, Uh talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And I was like, no, I'm like this keto (laughs) person. It's like my whole business is shaped around keto and like, I'm going to like lose my specialty and like, like, you know, had all all these fears. I was like, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And I was like, oh, I mean, my sweaty palms. The first time I ever was like, hey, everybody on social media, <laughs> so, um, I'm eating carbs again, right? As a keto specialist, yeah. I was like, Ugh. yeah. And so I started talking about it and talking about it, talking about it. And um, I was like, man, I'm going to be out of the keto club. I'm going to mm-hmm. lose my They're kicking you know, out and all this stuff. Um, less than a year later, I happened to go into um, LinkedIn. Cause I hardly ever check my LinkedIn. So if anybody's ever messaged me there and I didn't get to <laughs> back to you for like a year, <laughs> that's normal. Right. Happened to check. Like, oh yeah. LinkedIn had a book offer. Hey, we like what you're talking about, about bringing cars back in after keto. We want to offer you from one of the most renowned publishers in the health space. And so I was like, Holy crap. 
look what happens when you trust. Mm -hmm. Look what happens when you, you fall. It was like, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, let go of this like keto identity thing you got. Like, just be real with like where you're at now on your journey. I was like, (gasps) okay. And it led to that. So I'm only sharing that as a backup. to what Amanda just said, if you are feeling this, let it go, let it go, let Uh. it go. I was just a little poor girl from Virginia with a single mom, you know, that now my life just keeps getting more and more incredibly magical, unbelievable. Feels like I I know you resonate. It's like I'm on this Mm -hmm. like unbelievable magic carpet ride of life because I keep listening to those intuitive, let it go intuitive, go this way. And I was like, that's scary. I don't know. That's safe over here. And it's like, it's not, it's, it's not fun where you're at. Like, it's okay. It was part of your journey for a reason, but like here, 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 here. Yes. Trust it guys. I'm telling you, like we are two witnesses. Uh huh. (laughs) And two, two people. I love that that's in your story too. You know, one of the things that I talk about is that I I've had all of these miracles come into my life and it's not because of any specific advantage. I too come from a single mom, like did not grow up with money and, you know, had some abundance and mindset things to overcome. And what I realized is that alcohol just kept me tethered to that reality and really didn't allow me to expand into my full potential. And I, you know, I didn't have anyone, you know, bankrolling me or doing any of these things. All of the miracles that came into my life were me deciding to show up to my, for myself and to say yes to a bigger life. And, And just like you, you had to, uh, you know, look in the face of possible rejection and being ostracized from a group where you built your connections and your friendships and your business and just believing and trusting that your soul was guiding you to the right place. And I think that anytime we have a curiosity or an intuition placed on our heart, that it is, it is there for a reason. It is there for us to follow. And if it feels good, you are going to always wonder what if, if you don't listen to that intuitive little voice, even if it feels uncomfortable and usually it will, usually it will feel uncomfortable because it is new and different and is taking you away from the normal and the, the everyday things that are keeping you stuck in place. And look what, look what can happen though. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's hit in your social life, if you don't mind mm-hmm. a little bit. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious what that was like for you. So you have these like friend structures where you guys go drinking. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you at first? It was pretty scary. And I had just moved. Um, I live in Austin, Texas now, but I'm born and raised in Missouri. And I had just moved to Austin, Texas when I decided to quit drinking. And I had just re, you know, refabricated my friend group, but The interesting thing is that I had really wanted to step into this kind of more wellness and personal growth focused lifestyle when I moved here. And what happened was that I fell right back into the group I was comfortable with. So I was with the young professional party crew, CNBC, you know, go out and have drinks, happy hour, boozy brunch, charity events, all of these, all of these things. And about a year into it, I realized this is not what I wanted. This is how did I get here? And so I had to decide. I I'm, I just started over. Maybe I need, I'm going to have to start over again. And I had to be okay with saying, I'm going to release this friend group potentially, because I don't know if they'll still want to hang out with me. And so I kind of had this day of reckoning of, okay, a couple of things could possibly happen. Either they're going to hate me and they're going to think I'm a total dork and goody goody and just not want to hang out with me. Or I maybe, what if maybe I decide I don't want to hang out with them anymore. And it's not because they're bad or they're wrong or anything, just because what if I find other groups of people that resonate with me more and a little bit of both happened. I had some people from that friend group who we reconstructed our friendship to be things that were outside of drinking and partying and happy hours and those friends. And I stayed close. And then that created space for all of these other new possible friendships where I was, you know, I was with a more health focused crowd, a more entrepreneurial focused crowd and more spiritually focused crowd, but I wouldn't have even seen those people. I wouldn't even realize they existed if I wouldn't have opened up my kind of opened up my social scope by quitting drinking and Mm -hmm. shifted the way that I was seeing things. So it was really scary because I definitely had, and I was not a cool kid growing up. Please know that drinking was one of the ways that I tried my best to fit in. So I definitely had this track running in the background that was like, you're only going to be cool if you drink. Everyone's going to think you're a nerd or you won't know how to talk to people. So I was, I was scared. Let me be clear. And again, I chose faith over fear because I had faith that if I was feeling this way, there had to be other people out there 
who were cool and fun and successful and positive and loving that wanted to be my friend. And I hadn't just, I just hadn't met them yet. And I just had to, to hold on to that blind faith that these people existed, even though I hadn't seen them yet. And what do you know? They did. And the more that I leaned into being on what I know now is kind of my authentic path or the right path, the more those people just came out of the woodwork quickly and with ease. I mean, I had to leave my house like that, that they didn't just like pop into my door, but I would run into them all over the place. These people who were meant to be my soulmate friends. And before Mm -hmm. the friendships that I had were for better or worse, just a little superficial and surface level. So it's been so fulfilling, um, to have these deeper, more enriching friendships that I didn't even know were available before. Mm. I was doing a meditation on the beach in Oahu a few weeks ago. It was really powerful one. And I heard this. Usually I don't hear like audible type stuff, but Mm -hmm. I heard it sounded like the voice of angels. It was one of the most profound meditations I've ever had. And I just kept hearing with this like angelicness. I kept hearing you attract all that you are, you attract Mm. all that you are. And you talking about that. I heard if you want love, be love. If you want fun, be fun. If you Mm -hmm. want grace, be grace. If you want, you know, happiness, be happiness. I kept hearing, it just kept going through all these things. And you're reminding me of that. I love what you said about these people would have been invisible. I so resonate Mm -hmm. with that because as I have tapped into my own connection with myself of who I really am and what I really love and what I'm really about, all of a sudden my frequency changes. And now all of a sudden I've got all these friends that are kind and love nature and, you know, are thinking about the planet and how we're impacting them. And just all of a sudden they're just coming out of the woodwork. It's like, wow. And so that's an interesting thought too, of when you're drinking, what's going on with your relationship with yourself Mm -hmm. that's causing you to feel like you need drinking and what kind of people are you really attracting? You're attracting people who also feel that way. Yeah. You're matching your vibration. It's just like with everything. Right. And so what I, the the thing that I come down to is really esoteric is that typically it's very rare that I found that people don't drink or that people don't drink for one of these two reasons, which is to get to a state that they don't believe that they can reach on their own because they're not capable. So to be happier, more relaxed, more, 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 more of something, or to be less of something that they don't think is desirable. So I want to be less anxious. I want to be less awkward. Mm -hmm. I want to be less whatever. And when you're, you're putting a substance into your body for one of those two very subtle underlying reasons, you're communicating to yourself that you're too much or you're not enough. And that's Mm -hmm. not a powerful message to send yourself. So Mm -hmm. of course you're going to attract people who are also subconsciously, even if on the slightest, most delicate level, believing this and, and you're not going to be able to see anyone outside of that because you're kind of putting yourself in tunnel vision. And as soon as I allowed myself to like, just slightly tiptoe out of that mindset, like you said, yeah, all I had to do was be it just a little bit. Um, I don't know if you've ever dabbled in a course in miracles, but the course says that all that is required is your tiny willingness. Mm. And I had this tiny willingness to be something different. And all of a sudden, every, just from that tiny willingness, I got all of these opportunities and friendships and things that I just didn't even see before because I was stuck in tunnel vision. Mm, 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 mm. Powerful. Yeah. Okay. I want to, I want to drop into, if you don't mind the first time in a social situation, Mm -hmm. you decided not to drink and other people were drinking. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was was really not inside of you. I go ahead. Well, I definitely felt awkward. I will remember that and probably Mm -hmm. struggled to have conversation and was like feeling like, well, why am I doing this? But I remember that specifically because, you know, I quit drinking during dry January and a lot of my friends had decided I'm using my little quote fingers, decided to do it too. And by the first weekend, I remember so crystal clear that almost all of them were falling off the wagon. We had gone out to some event and most of them were already drinking. Like they just couldn't handle a full week. And that would have been me years ago. I would have used that as a permission slip. Well, everyone else is doing it. So I'm going to do it too. But for some reason, my resolve had changed. And even though I felt awkward, 
I at least was among friends who I felt comfortable enough with. And there was something about me that my stubbornness overrode the awkwardness. So I was like, I'm freaking staying out till midnight and I am not drinking. And even if it's uncomfortable, I'm going to do this to prove it to myself that I can. And I really just dug my heels in. Mm -hmm. So I remember having all of these thoughts going through my head, like, what are they thinking? Or I'm not having as much fun or I'm not fun. Or they think I'm not fun, but also feeling really powerful because I made the decision that I'm not going to fall off the wagon as I'm really sticking to it. And at the end of the night, my confidence overrode the awkwardness I felt. And that felt really cool too. But let me tell you there, I, I definitely felt I, it just things, things weren't fun. The the being out and and being in a crowded rowdy bar wasn't fun anymore. And that was a humbling experience too, to realize that some of the things I thought were fun were just fun because I was drunk and not in my full consciousness. And, Mm. um, yeah, so it was a, it was an interesting experience, a combination of feeling awkward and bored, but also feeling really powerful and confident. Wow. Uh, so we talked about some of yours and obviously you've talked to a lot of people about this now, Mm -hmm. the drinking thing. Yeah. So would you, would you say, you know, and I love always to see like commonalities root deep, like, okay, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Like, what is it, what is it at its core? And I kind of wonder if you just hit on it a little bit is like a belief that I am not good enough as I am and yeah. I need this and this belittling, you know, what are some of the core things you see at the very root mm-hmm. of this, you know, social quote unquote addiction? I'm not, you know, yeah. because honestly, like if they're saying I'm going to do dry January and a week into it, they can't handle anymore. That is, yeah. it's, it's a dependency at, at the least, right? Dependency, yeah. It's right. a dependency at the least. And I, I think it is. Yeah. It comes down to these very subtle beliefs that why, why, why are you drinking? It's to become more of something that you don't think you are already, or to become less of something that you think is un unsavory to other people. And so if we're always drinking to become more charismatic, more sexy, more funny, more energetic, or to be less anxious, to be less um, sad or to be less frustrated or angry or stressed, then we are internally saying you either are not worthy of feeling those big emotions. You're not capable of feeling those emotions and handling those emotions, or you are not able to figure life out for yourself. You are not able to handle what life throws at you or even worse. You are not deserving of true happiness. And I know that one, that one, I would need to go into a little more depth to explain, but any of those messages are so self-depleting. Yeah. And of course, you're not literally saying, hand me a beer. I don't think I can handle life right now. Right. But, I mean, kind of. Some people say, I need a drink. This is too hard. Right. And or I need a drink. I feel too awkward. I, I need a drink to handle this situation. And so it's just this like little form of self-abandonment that we do yeah. to cheat our way through something and just to internally say, I'm not capable or I don't trust myself enough to try. And that is messed up that we are doing that now, granted that this message isn't for everyone. Some people are just going to hear this and be like, that's BS. But some of you, I know this is landing for right now. I know that you're thinking, whoa, yeah, that's esoteric as hell. But I do that. That is, (laughs) that is hitting the nail on the head. And if that's resonating, like I, I just like implore you to listen and follow that deeper because I know that that really resonates with me when I look back at the young woman who was you know, trying to be carefree. And like, I call her my like little inner Carrie Bradshaw. I was trying to be someone else. I was trying to be what I thought was more socially acceptable and wasn't honoring who I was authentically. And I, I have a lot of love for that version of me that, you know, was just trying her best. And, and I have a lot of love for everyone who's in that place where you're just trying your best, but ultimately you're cutting yourself short you're cutting yourself short and playing small and we need to see you play big. We need to see that. And you deserve that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, on the social kind of like social anxiety ish mm-hmm. vein of this, you know, that I see come up so much with clients of like, well, like I'll, I'll, I'll like, I'm not going to be able to connect with anybody. Like it just helps me loosen up so I can like be more fun and blah, 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 blah. Mm. Uh, the way I say it is this is like, I have some friends who are kind of shy 
Yeah. I love that about them. Yes. That's the endearing part of you. Yeah. I don't need them to be any different than they are. And like the friends who really love you, like if you feel a little shy when you meet new people, like I love that about my friend. Yes. I don't need her to turn into somebody else. No. To like her. It's uh-uh. sweet. It's like, I got your back. Like, it's okay. Yes. You know? And, and so, your true friends will feel that way. They right. will find those pieces of you that you think are awkward or broken. So yeah. endearing. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's forcing yourself into this fixed image of who you should be versus mm-hmm. like the potential of attracting people in your life who just love you exactly as you are. It's okay. Mm-hmm. He gets kind of, he gets kind of stressed out about stuff. I love you. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. here to listen. Like, I don't need you to blanket this with a bunch of drinks so that you can be a certain way for me. I just love you Ooh. as you are. <laughs> I love that. You know, it reminds me, I wrote down this really edgy thought the other day that like you right now are embodying what it means to be a true friend, because there's so many friends that if they, if, you know, your friend were feeling stressed or he were feeling heartbroken or whatever, instead of listening to him and embracing him, you would say, oh, here. You, you deserve a drink, but that's just you being a lazy friend and not yeah. like really sitting down and getting vulnerable yeah. with someone. And that's, wouldn't be any fault. That's, I mean, culture has taught us to do that. We have not been equipped many of us with the tools to communicate and embrace people's, you know, character flaws and the heavy stuff in life. But you were exam- exemplifying like tried and true friendship of like being willing to show up for someone and not like shortcut past the hard stuff. And that is what a good friend will do. Yeah. It's love. That's what love is. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. You hit on something I gotta, I gotta ask, cause I know people probably caught it too. You said that I'm not deserving of living a good life thing Mm -hmm. and you need a second. What do you mean by that? So the, you know, I, I love this book called the six pillars of self-esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. And he says that self-esteem is made up of two things. One, the belief that we are capable of handling whatever life throws at us. And two, the belief that we are deserving of happiness. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about alcohol is we use it both to commiserate, to like get ourselves through the tough moments, but also to celebrate. But when we put alcohol into our bodies, it cuts off our emotional center. So let's say something really happy happens to me or you, and we decide to have a drink. What we do in that moment, instead of letting ourselves feel the profundity of happiness, which is really big. If you experience really big joy, you know, that sometimes it can feel overwhelming. It's like, you're having like a, whoa, like energy is surging through your body. That's it's the rock star effect, right? There's dopamine, Mm -hmm. there's endorphins, there's all of these things. It can feel almost unmanageable. And Mm -hmm. so what we do then is we pulch it down with a little alcohol. But when we do that, we stop ourselves. We limit our happiness to that moment. We limit our happiness. We we pickle it to that moment. And so again, subconsciously, we're sending this message of this is, this is my limit of happiness. Um, this is where, this is where my joy is cut off, but because it's touted as this like social, you know, tool for celebration, we don't clock that, but mentally and emotionally what's happening is you can't, your happiness can't go past that point because it's blocked. You are blocking all the receptors. And, and so it's this like, subtle manipulation that we do, or we don't allow ourselves to be truly happy because there's so much more happiness that's able to be felt, but it can feel overwhelming in our system. And so Mm -hmm. I see this as honestly a struggle that some of my clients have is embracing happiness as they get into really being alcohol-free and feeling into their emotions is true happiness and joy feels foreign to them because they've never let themselves get there. And it's really humbling and sad and frustrating when I see that, because I imagine how many people have never really experienced and let themselves experience joy and celebration and pride and love. And, and it's just really wild to think of. Does that, does that kind of like resonate? Yeah, Yeah. I never thought about it like that. And you're making me think, you know, I had a unique journey with alcohol because I was Mormon until I was mm-hmm. 33 years old. Okay. Yeah. So I had never had got a late start. not even one drop of alcohol yep. at 33, never, nothing, yeah. zero. And so then when I, I, I left that religion, of course, alcohol was on the table now. Right. Mm-hmm. But I had already gone through a massive health transformation. I had completely changed my body and my health mm-hmm. and the way I saw food and exercise and all of that. And so I was pretty tuned into my body when I started alcohol for the first time. Yeah. And every single time I would have it, I was just like, this stuff sucks. Why do people <laughs> like this? Like, yeah. 
I actually feel I started just because this is the same process I did with food to mm-hmm. help my help myself get into a more natural ease place with mm-hmm. food. I just started noticing how the foods made me feel. Yeah. And so I had that pattern in me. And so I would notice during the actual time of alcohol. Yeah. I could see how everybody would get more silly and stuff like that. But, I, but I, but I was more experienced with noticing the, the mm, fine details the of how I was showing up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I feel less connected to mm-hmm. people. Yeah. We're joking around and stuff, but I don't, I feel a little scattered and like, I'm not as present one-on-one with somebody. I kind of got this like veil between yeah. me and them. And I don't, I don't like that. I feel yeah. way more connected without it. And then I got to deal with all this shit mm-hmm. afterwards. Then the yep. next day I got to feel suboptimal all day. And I, it, during the moment I felt less connected. And now after I'm going to feel crappy all day, like, mm-hmm. no, thank you. And it just yeah. slowly started to drift into this. I still don't have any like hard line with alcohol. I just don't want it. I've had yeah. it maybe you know, I'll have it maybe once a year at a health event when they got some like health, health conscious wine. And even then I tried it once last year and I was like this past year and I was uh-huh. like, nah, like it didn't, that didn't do anything for me. Like, no, thank you. Like, and so I think also, if you just really start to notice how you actually feel mm-hmm. like actually feel <sighs> It, it ain't you that good. It's, you it's will start so to see is like, this is massively detracting from my quality of life. Massively. Totally. Oh, I so. love how you came to it from that really intuitive place though, of, you know, you know, just kind of when you're doing, you're trying to figure out how sugar, gluten, whatever, right. like feels in your body. You, I mean, there is no question about it. Maybe for a moment you feel euphoric with alcohol, right. but the thing that you tuned into of being disconnected and then feeling hungover, sluggish, whatever the feelings are the next day are, it's such a uneven scale. The the small amount that we're willing, it's, it's almost like, you know, I don't know. It's just a really shitty relationship where you accept like breadcrumbs and, and think that it's the most wonderful thing. And, and it's so wild that, you know, I think that because you came into it a little, you know, more, you probably were a little more emotionally resourced as an adult. Mm -hmm. You were able to have a very different perspective because it hadn't like fully like brainwashed you. It hadn't been this tool that you've come up with, but that perspective is so helpful because it can, if you can share that with someone else and as you share it with someone else, they can realize, Oh yeah, I actually don't feel good. I actually don't feel as connected. A lot of the conversations Mm -hmm. I'm having, yeah, they're more free flowy, but they're kind of superficial. They don't mean mm-hmm. anything. And mm-hmm. that's what I felt too. I actually felt disconnected and lonely yeah. in a lot of my relationships yeah. with al- when alcohol was present because they were, we're talking about BS, nothing right. important or deep or vulnerable. Right. Yeah. And I know that, you know, that self-worth thing, I know that's such a huge thing. So if you're, if any of this resonating with you, definitely get Amanda's book. We'll link it in the show notes, but yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that in, um, clients, I'll, I'll start this pattern. It's the same pattern I use with food, right? It's mm-hmm. the same. I use the same pattern. And yep. I'm just like, how did, you know, what led into it? How are you feeling? Just notice, you know, let's not restrict it first. Let's just start noticing how you feel, noticing how you feel. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, over the course of that with clients, they would start to say the next day, like, oh, I felt like shit. Mm-hmm. I felt like shit the next day. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. But underneath that was exactly what you said of just this. I deserve to feel like shit. That was yes. really what was at the core. Ooh, ooh, yeah. I deserve yeah. to feel like shit, mm-hmm. you know. And I deserve to abandon myself mm-hmm. at night and just say f it and have all mm-hmm. the junk food and all that, you know. Because a lot yeah. of drinking leads into suboptimal eating for people too. Oh, yeah, usually go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Once the drinks come in, then they're like, oh, I don't care about anything because it's this memo to themselves of. I already just don't care about myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. It's a slippery slope for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, man, this has been such an incredible conversation, Amanda. Thank you for, thank you for that shower moment. Thank you for yes. listening to that shower oh, thank moment. Thank you for letting me share it. So special. How crazy was it that you probably had no idea that it literally was going to be helping people understand how much better their life could get without Never. alcohol. Or nope. you had no idea what was coming. No, I was um, like, I don't know what that means voice up there, but I'm just going to roll with it. And wow. 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 I'm so glad I did. So incredible. Thank you for showing up and doing the work. Cause writing a book is really hard guys. It is it's a lot of it. work. 
is so much work. So thank mm-hmm. you for doing that work. Um, Unbottled Potential Breakup with Alcohol and Breakthrough to Your Best Life is the book. We will link that up. We'll also link up um, your website. Um, and if and um, you have social media, correct? Yep. We'll oh yeah. I'm on that. Instagram, TikTok every, well, not everywhere, but Instagram and TikTok mostly at Amanda Kuda. And yeah, if, if I'd love to connect if this resonated with you today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here today. 